Hey guys, Ben here from Ad Coach, and in this video, I'm going to talk about ad blocking. Now, many of you may use some sort of ad blocking technology, and you may be curious about how it works and how the ad industry has responded to it, and that's what I'm going to cover in this video. This clip is an excerpt from my Digital Advertising and Marketing 301 class, which you can find on adcoach.co and using the link in the description. For more free content like this, make sure to like and subscribe to this channel. And with that being said, let's get into the video. Welcome to Digital Advertising and Marketing 301 section on ad blocking. In this section, we're going to cover the history of ad blocking, the Coalition for Better Ads, market penetration of ad blockers, uh, different ad blocking companies and how they work, uh, and then the industry response to ad blocking as a whole. So to start with, ad blocking really is nothing new and it's not unique just to digital. The remote control was actually originally invented so that a user could change the station specifically when there is an ad break so they wouldn't have to sit through an ad, they could switch to other content. More recently, we have seen the introduction of companies like TiVo, which allow TV users to record a show and then fast forward through the commercials. And then we also have companies like Sirius XM, which offered commercial free radio, but of course for a monthly fee. Recently, Google has also made a play into the ad blocking space by preventing certain ads from running specifically within their Chrome web browser. And it may sound counterintuitive that Google, who makes about $80 billion a year in advertising revenue, would want to prevent uh, people from showing ads. But Google has taken the stance of saying, we are the industry expert and we are going to put down what we think are best practices. And if we say they're best practices from Google, then they really should be and others should follow suit. And if you are an advertiser that is trying to run digital ads online, you'll have a tough time with uh, not working through Google. So pretty much everyone would have to follow suit if Google makes a change. Some recent changes they introduced in 2015 include uh, they stopped supporting any ads that run Flash in the Chrome web browser. At the time, 90 plus percent of all display banners that you saw on your Chrome browser or on your desktop were built in Flash. The industry had already started moving away from that in that the uh, iPhone did not support Flash. So if it was a mobile unit, it had to be a, a static unit or built in HTML5. Google made this change for their desktop browser because Flash is a very heavy program. It takes a long time to load. It uses more bandwidth on your computer. So that's why the mobile phone didn't accept it. It was too much work for a mobile phone to process that. And Google decided that they were going to remove it entirely from their web browser as well. Uh, they gave the industry about a three month heads up before that change was made. So every advertiser that was running an ad had to scramble to make their units into a static image or into an HTML5. They also went a step further by saying they're going to lower the rank of websites in their search engine if they have too many ads. And for mobile websites, specifically if the mobile site had too many interstitial ads, they would lower their rank as well. So it not only meant that uh, websites could potentially lose revenue from uh, advertisers that weren't building their ads to spec, but now they could rank lower within the search engine, which could be killer for uh, tra websites that were ranking very high. Afterwards, Google uh, went a step further and uh, started to form the Coalition for Better Ads. The Coalition for Better Ads is made up of a number of large industry tech companies, advertisers, and agencies, including Critio, Facebook, Group M, the IAB, Microsoft, Procter & Gamble, Publicis, and many more. The idea was that they would form a coalition of advertisers and tech companies to essentially review what's going on with the digital space, what ads are working, which are not effective, and what is causing people to use these ad blockers, and can they do something about it? Direct from the Coalition for Better Ads website, they say they are 
leading international trade associations and companies involved in online media form the Coalition for Better Ads to improve consumers' experience with online advertising. The Coalition for Better Ads will leverage consumer insights and cross-industry expertise to develop and implement new global standards for online advertising that address consumer expectations. So what does that mean? Well, they're going to look at a number of different ad units. On desktop, it could be something like a pop-up or an auto-playing video ad with sound, large ads, or other ads that they deem could be problematic and see if they want to not necessarily outlaw them, but recommend against using them and remove them from the recommended ad type. Uh, Same thing with mobile websites. A look at pop-ups, interstitial ads, autoplay with sound, and get an idea of where consumers are finding issues uh, with these ads and if they're really even effective or worth billing to begin with. Uh, For more information, you can visit their website, betterads.org. Definitely worth it to go through and look at who's on there, which uh, organizations and companies are involved. Uh, Good idea to see where the industry is going. This is definitely an ongoing issue. It's not going to be something that will be just solved one day and that'll be it. This is something that I expect to be uh, a long-term organization. Now that gets us to what I think most people think of when we say the word ad blocking, which would be this idea of uh, an extension on your browser or something you download to your mobile app that actually blocks ads from showing uh, when you're using the internet. So ad blocker penetration is actually pretty high. We see uh, in 2018, that is about 30% of internet users in the US do use some form of an ad blocker. This can vary a little bit based on demographic. A younger demographic is more likely to use an ad blocker than an older demographic. Um, but obviously, it's a pretty big issue if nearly one out of every three users uh, may be blocking ads entirely. That can be costing billions of dollars a year in potential ad revenue. So which companies are out there uh, running these? Well, there are three big ones. AdGuard, uh, they are a paid uh, extension. You can pay a couple dollars for that one. You can use Adblock Plus, which is one of the larger ones. They are free for users. And then Adblock, which is another one. They are also free for users. So how do these actually work? Well, as we talked about in Digital Advertising 101, the websites use a ad server to manage their actual ads. So when the page loads, a call is made to the ad server to find an ad and display it on their website. What an ad blocker does is actually interrupts that call. So the call is never made to the ad server and the ad server cannot respond with an ad. So nothing is shown on the page. No impression is fired. After that goes through, that process takes place. Uh, In some cases, the website may expand their content to take up more space, space that otherwise would have been used up by the ad or you may just see a blank space on the website, just open white nothingness where an ad otherwise would have been. So how do they work from a revenue standpoint though? We talked about AdGuard is a paid platform, so that makes sense, but the other ones are blocking ads, which is how companies make money. So how are they generating revenue? Well, one is through donations, both AdBlock and AdBlock Plus ask for donations from their users, and there are plenty of users that may be willing to donate a few dollars for the convenience of this extension and the software, and they have tens of millions of users, so you can imagine a few bucks a piece would be a pretty nice little piece of revenue. The other option is Adblock Plus has what's called the Acceptable Ads Criteria, and essentially what they're doing is they are charging large advertisers a fee in order to not block their ads. So if you're Procter & Gamble, Walmart, Coca-Cola, Nike, McDonald's, a large advertiser running billions of impressions of digital ads, you could go to Adblock Plus and pay them so that Adblock Plus won't block their ads. And you're using that ad blocker and you'll still see ads, Procter & Gamble, Nike, Coca-Cola, whoever may be working through this program. So the way it works is they say from their website, only large entities have to pay 
we qualify an entity as large when it gains more than 10 million additional ad impressions per month due to participation in the acceptable ads initiative. And for those working through this, the fee is about 30% of the additional revenue created by whitelisting its acceptable ads. So that's not necessarily a cheap fee. You're talking about companies that have already spent millions of dollars just to buy the ads, make the, have the ads created, buy the media placement. Now they have to pay another 30% to get their ads to actually show. Obviously, that could be a very pricey situation. Now, if you're a website, how do you know if people are using an ad blocker? Well, there are analytics tools, ad block analytics being one of them, that you can install onto a website or a mobile app or a mobile website, and they will measure how many users are actually using an ad blocker and on how many pages. So you can see things like uh, the country, the browser type, desktop versus mobile, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, this can be really important if you have a low blockage rate, that can be very good. And you may use that when you go to an advertiser to try to pitch a direct sale. Uh, also, if your ad block rate is really high, you can figure out is there something you can do to address that. Maybe you could change the units that you're showing so the people are less incentivized to use an ad blocker. Or I'm sure many of you who uh, have an ad blocker may have seen a situation where you're prompted with an ask to not use it. Uh, so Forbes, for example, they may say we've detected that you're using an ad blocker and they'll ask you to whitelist it and you can whitelist it for access to the site and they may block you from using the site at all if you have an ad blocker installed or a uh, site may just ask you politely, hey, we make money using advertising. Would you mind whitelisting us? They won't block you from using the site, but they'll at least make an effort to get you to whitelist their particular site. So the industry response to Adblock Plus uh, has been uh, a lot, actually. As you can see, we had the Coalition for Better Ads and the IAB. So some interesting things. Uh, in 2016, the IAB revoked an invitation to Adblock Plus to its annual leadership conference. Uh, and the IAB has encouraged advertisers to not pay Adblock Plus to have their ads shown. They're essentially saying this company is holding your ads hostage. Do not pay the ransom fee. We're going to make a stand as an industry to say, we are not going to do this. You cannot hold us hostage. And then they also the IAB released the Lean Ad Initiative to counter ad blocker use. The Lean Ads is a set of standards the IAB hopes the industry will adopt to address the reasons consumers use ad blockers, such as frequency capping, no longer retargeting users after they make a purchase, and fewer ads per page. Uh, the idea here is that these are issues that cause people to use an ad blocker to begin with. If we get rid of them, then there will be no incentive to use an ad blocker at all. So overall, the Coalition for Better Ads and the IAB are making a really big stand to say, we understand that users are not happy with the advertising experience they're getting, and it's costing us money. We have to adopt. Most internet users will agree that if they are getting content for free from a website or an app, that being shown ads is a fair trade-off, but only to an extent. That ad cannot be overly intrusive. It cannot be annoying. It cannot disrupt the user experience or the content that they're trying to see. And that is why ad blockers have come up and become such an issue. So through these two initiatives, the industry is trying to address the, these problems and get people to not want to use an ad blocker, not feel like they have to use an ad blocker uh, because these ads are no longer intrusive or annoying or, or too many. Uh, in addition to that, advertisers can also find ways to integrate their ad into the actual content of uh, an actual of the site or of the publisher. So we see here on ESPN, uh, you have an ad for Genesis, which is a car company or an actual car brand, and they are building their logo into the content itself. So as we mentioned, the ad blocker works by stopping the call to the ad server so no ad can show. But in this situation, no call is being made to an ad server because the ad is built into the actual content, the organic content you're watching. 
So an ad blocker cannot prevent that from happening. Uh, things like this are definitely becoming more popular, especially for sites that were losing money to programmatic. They are now going back to advertise and say, we can do this custom integration where we can integrate you and your logo and your brand right into the content itself. It won't be affected by ad blocking and you can't buy it programmatically. So that wraps up ad blocking on digital advertising and marketing 301.